Hello and welcome to the Compassion Fatigue Podcast. I'm your host, Jennifer Blau. You're listening to Session 19. My guest today is Dr. Mark Beckhoff. He is the Professor Emeritus of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Colorado Boulder and co-founder with Jane Goodall of Ethologist for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. Mark has won many awards for his scientific research, including the Exemplar Award for Animal Behavior Society and a Guggenheim Fellowship. Mark has published more than 1,000 essays, 30 books, and has edited three encyclopedias. His books can be found at the show notes page of the CompassionFatiguePodcast.com, but just some of these works include the Encyclopedia of Animal Rights and Animal Welfare, The Animal Manifesto, Six Reasons for Increasing Our Compassion Footprint. Why Dogs Hump and Bees Get Depressed, The Fascinating Science of Animal Intelligence, Emotions, Friendship, and Conservation. And Rewilding Our Hearts, Building Pathways of Compassion and Coexistence. Mark's new book, The Animal's Agenda, Freedom, Compassion, and Coexistence in the Human Age with co-author Jessica Pierce was just released. And in early 2018, Mark will release Canine Confidential, an insider's guide to the best lives for dogs and us. In 2005, Mark was presented with the Bank One Faculty Community Service Award for the work he has done with children, seniors, and prisoners. In 2009, he was presented with the St. Francis of Assisi Award by the New Zealand SPCA. And here's a fun fact. In 1986, Mark became the first American to win his age class at the Tour de Arvois bicycle race. And I really hope that I didn't butcher that. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Mark Beckoff. Hi, Mark. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Compassion Fatigue Podcast. How are you? I'm fine, Jennifer, and thanks for having me. I never thought I would be on something like this, and I'm really excited to talk with you. I am really honored to have you on. So for our listeners, I gave that wonderful intro of you, and you have authored so many books. You have a new book coming out, and we will talk about that later on in the podcast. But right now, I want to address the difference between empathy and compassion. Can you kind of break those down for our listeners? Yeah, I mean, people use them interchangeably, but generally the way I think of it very simply is compassion means taking action and empathy means, you know, putting yourself in another person's shoes or hearts or since I study non-human animals, their paws Hmm. and, you know, um, coming to an understanding, if you will, a feeling of what's going on. And then compassion means, to me at least, using that I mean, in a sense, using that empathy, using, you know, the ability to step into another individual's heart, I like to say, perhaps their head and their heart, and and then using that to help them along in a compassionate way. So that that's that's my simple breakdown. I, I know people use them interchangeably, and I think sometimes I find that breaking down to be not false, but confusing to people. So compassion is an act, maybe. Yeah, so it sounds like empathy is a feeling, and then compassion is actually doing something about that feeling, putting it into action. Exactly, right. And, and you know, what I was thinking about when I was thinking about, you know, that difference is, I suppose there's also something that one might call empathy fatigue. I hear that, you know, from people saying, God, it's just kind of at the point where I just don't have any more energy to put into say, trying to understand what another person or another animal is feeling. So I could see that, but I think it really comes down when I talk to people about the compassion fatigue really being that they're doing so many different things and they're just kind of losing balance, if you will. Maybe that's the best way to start it. Sure. I think the more empathy we have, the more we're going to be kind of inspired or motivated to have that compassion or or to do something about that empathy. And that's where we can get into trouble. We try to do so much. We're so empathic that we end up with compassion fatigue or, or even burned out. Yeah. 
Absolutely. I mean, you see that across the board in caregivers. My, my sister does music therapy in hospice situations for humans. And she's been doing it for a really long time. And I think one way that she gets through it is she's fully aware of, you know, what could happen. And she takes time to rekindle herself. I'm sure we'll get into some of that. So biologically speaking, do you think that humans are inherently empathic? I do. I mean, I've read a few studies that show across culturally that people are inherently empathic. You know, sometimes people say, well, what does inherent mean? You know, is it inborn? Is it in our genes? I don't really know that. And I don't think anybody really knows it. But, you know, the studies show that cross-culturally, there seems to be this capacity and one might even say desire among some people to be able to to want to and be able to identify with others' feelings. So, I yeah, I do. I, I can't see any reason not to not to make that claim based on what we know. And I think the once again for non-human animals, once you know the database is really not particularly high. But if you look at a lot of non-human animals, even you know, predators, and I'm not saying that they're bad or good or violent, but, you know, animals who are typically predators, they have a lot of cooperative and empathic social interactions among themselves in groups. And so my take is that there's this predisposition towards being empathic that can then be modified due to an individual's social experience, perhaps developmental experience. It's really an area that needs a lot more study, but that's my take. So what exactly is the science behind empathy is, is, as far as the brain is concerned? Well, that's where I, I, at first, you know, the first thing I'll say is I'm not an expert here. The second thing I'll say that it, it seems to me that the science behind it, and I, and I may be off base here, I was trying to do a bit of research, is there's this hormone called oxytocin, which people call the love hormone, the cooperation hormone, and it's part and parcel of certainly mammalian brains. And I, I'm assuming other animals have the same or some you know, analog of oxytocin. And so I think that that's where it seems to me a lot of people are concentrating, at least in the non-human literature. They may be doing it in the human literature too. I just don't, I don't know that area. But I think that's where the science is. The other is that across mammals, at least, all mammals share the same basic structures, uh, neuroanatomical, and show the same neurochemistry in the amygdala and the areas of the brain that are involved in, um, I guess, experiencing emotions. And so once again, that would say that those areas of the brain have evolved in a conservative way, we might say, and they're shared by all mammals. So that's where people seem to be going now. Can you explain to our listeners what mirror neurons are? Mirror neurons are neurons that fire when an individual sees an other individual performing an act. So the way that I look at it is, and, and the, the experiments that were done, to be honest with you, were very invasive originally on monkeys. And the, the data that were first collected were almost by accident. So a situation was, you know, had a monkey wired up and people were looking at EEGs or electroencephalograms when the monkey was doing something. And apparently at one point, a researcher saw a monkey I think, move an object. It may have been picking up a pencil. I don't remember. But the important point here was the monkey performed a motor act. It, the monkey did something and certain neurons in their brain fired. And then when the monkey saw another individual do the same act, the same neurons fired in the monkey who was doing the observation, who was observing another monkey. The argument is that these neurons that fired when the animal was watching another animal do the same act were mirroring what happened when that individual himself or herself performed the behavior. So it might be that I look at something and I feel really sad and certain neurons fire and then I see another individual doing the same thing, looking at something that makes them sad, and my neurons fire, even though I'm not 
the individual doing the looking. And so do these particular neurons, do they play a role in empathy? There's a lot of debate about this, Jennifer. And once again, I'm not an expert in it, but a couple of years ago, I talked to some people about it who are, and they're very, very cautious. You know, the way a lot of science is done, and I don't mean it in any critical way, is people come up with these discoveries, say, of mirror neurons, uh, the same with oxytocin, for example. And then all of a sudden, it becomes a general, a general explanation for a whole class of phenomena. So after mirror neurons were described, there were tons of papers calling them the biological basis of empathy, saying that they were definitely involved in empathy. Now people are saying, well, you know, some depending on who the researchers are, you know, they'll say, yeah, they are, but, you know, they're not the only show in town. So my take on it is that we still may need more data, but they provide a reasonable explanation for, say, the neural basis of empathy. The other thing I'll say is how they then translate into how you translate the feelings into action, of course, is really, I don't think anybody knows, to be quite frank with you. So like, you know, so many other aspects of the brain, we, we have so much yet to discover. Oh, we, it's, I know, and that's what's so exciting. I mean, I'm definitely in my own research and in my view of, you know, the way we use animals, if you will. I don't like the word use. I'm all for non-invasive research. And I think a lot of solid information is being collected and will be collected using neuroimaging, like functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRIs, for example. And that research is being done on a good number of non-human animals. And, you know, that might be one of the areas that really will answer the question about the role of mirror neurons, for example. I think we're a ways off, but I'm excited about that, actually. I, I think that if we can do neuroimaging in a very non-invasive way, then we're going to get a good handle on the neurobiology of empathy. And I would imagine that as we make more discoveries of the non-human brain, that hopefully that will change the way we view and treat animals. I sure hope so. Yeah. I mean, in this, in this new book we have coming out called The Animal's Agenda, we, we write about that a lot, not only with respect to neuroimaging, but you know, with respect to filling what we call the knowledge gap. Basically, the bumper sticker for that would be using what we know on behalf of other animals. And, and for some people, you know, when you look at behavior and you come up with reasonable explanations, it's not enough. They want to see the neurobiology behind it. What I think is really exciting, <clears throat> it goes beyond the study of only empathy, is that so many of the neurobiological findings are supporting, say, the explanations and the inferences we make from watching animals. I, get, I just, when I, when I write, I sometimes keep a list of things just because it kind of motivates me to keep going is, does this particular, say, neuroimaging study support what behavioral data have shown? And the answer is yes. Mm. It's really, it's exciting. I, I think the next decade or so is going to really open the door for some phenomenal research in empathy, looking at the function or the role of mirror neurons, and trying to understand how feelings turn into action. Wow. So I, I, I want to dig into that deeper. So on a personal note, my so I had uh, a pet mouse that I had to put to sleep a couple days ago. And let me tell you, I am not ashamed to say I cried like a baby. So why do some people connect with or have empathy for animals more than others? You know, I, w <laughs> I think that that is, maybe I'm aging myself, that old $64,000 question. I think that, I don't know that we really, we know that. I mean, you know, people ask me about my own experiences, and I'm very pleased and proud to say that I grew up in a very warm, soft, if you will, household. My mother was, I always call her a love muffin, and she was very compassionate, very empathic. And so, you know, did I get some of that from her? Oh, yeah, I'm sure I did. Um, am I genetically or, you know, neurobiologically different? 
um, than other people. I really don't know. I work with prisoners. I've been teaching a course for 15 years on animal behavior and, um, say, conservation at the Boulder County Jail. And we talk a lot about this. And some of the guys just really open up and just say they grew up in horrific, they had horrific childhoods. And empathy, compassion was, it wasn't, it wasn't that it wasn't rewarded. It was almost punished for some of them. And as they rehab, and what I'm pleased about as they rehab and they learn about animal behavior and empathy and compassion displayed by non-human animals, it softens them. I've actually got some beautiful essays about how just talking about what you and I are talking about really helps them along. Yeah, so it's that old nature versus uh, nature versus nurture debate, and and the reality is it's probably a little bit of both. Oh, I think so. I mean, I know that. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the nature nurture dis- debate, you know, the learning versus instinct debate. I think it's coming down to, with very few exceptions, that it's an interplay of both. So, you know, are some people more genetically you know, predisposed to feel empathy and display compassion. Maybe they are, but I think it's, I think it's a bit of both. What I really like, and I've done this, I've seen this with, you know, dogs who I've rescued, and I've seen this among some of the inmates, is how learning about some of this material has really changed them. I, I you know, there's just no other way to say it. And so, so I'd like to think, you know, getting back to what you said earlier, that perhaps we're, innately wired or genetically wired or genetically predisposed, you know, to be empathic beings that, that would be nature, of course, that nurture could throw, you know, a pump in the spokes, if you will, of that process. Yeah. You know, and speaking of empathy and compassion, I I think another topic that is important to our listeners is that of what I call eco-grief. So the destruction of the planet and so many of our species being at risk of extinction, you know, this can really bring on just a whole new level of compassion fatigue and burnout. Can you expand on this concept and and also um, let our listeners know what ecocide is? Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest to say, and and I don't mean this in any self-serving way, nor do I mean it in a heartless way. The other part of my upbringing was to grow up with an extremely optimistic father who in, you know, in, in situations that would, you know, literally drive other people crazy, he could always maintain his optimism. So I don't feel the eco grief like some people do. And that's not to say that it's not real. It's, it's extremely real. I talk to people, and I get emails from people who are just, if you will, over the top. They just the you know we're losing species at an unprecedented rate we're losing their homes we're destroying the planet and they see no hope for the future i think part of it is tied into compassion fatigue and you know some of the people with whom i talk and who and who i know well in all honesty i can just say look you need a break you need to refill your gas tank if you will and step away from what you're doing because you're burning out and you're suffering from what people call this eco grief. So I can understand that. I mean, ecocide is a word. Some people like it, some don't. I'm pretty neutral on it. For me, though, when I've used it in some of my writings is that we're killing the planet. I mean, in a general way, we're just, we are killing the planet. And people who say, oh, well, you know, we're doing horrible things, but there's always hope because the planet is resilient. You know, the ecosystems are resilient. No, they're not. And I think anybody who stays tuned in what's happening today knows the rubber band, if you will, is being stretched to the point where it's going to pop or in some areas it has popped. And so I see this eco grief as being burnout because of a loss of hope. And it's not the loss of the ability to empathize and be empathic. It's more the the people, they, they just don't have room for it. You know what I mean? They run out of gas. I, I, I use that analogy. I, I, the, the, the metaphor I like is we have five fingers, right? And there's one, two, three, four, five, if you're normally built and one finger may go to normal basal metabolism. Another may go to getting through the day. 
But the point there is there's finite number of fingers. And when you run out of fingers, you don't have anything. And we have finite amounts of energy. People really vary in how much energy they have, if you will, or how energetic they have, they are. So they need to be careful not to deplete the tank so they don't have energy then to refuel and if they regain the hope and, and overcome the ego grief. Yeah, because empathy and compassion, I mean, they, <laughs> they take up a lot of energy. Oh, they do. And that's why, I mean, you know, in a sense, that's why you and I are talking. I mean, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Hence this podcast. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, oh, they do. I, they do. I mean, and I, I mean, you know, I experience it too. And I have my own ways of, if you will, recouping. And um, one of the ways, one thing I do, and it's due to the suggestion that I got years ago by somebody and then in a different form from a current friend. And that is when I feel that I'm out of balance, when I'm kind of looking at things, you know, the glass is half empty rather than the glass is half full. I stop doing what I'm doing and I'm a cyclist. I raced bikes for years. I could ride upwards of 10 or 12,000 miles a year. I don't do that now, but I go for a bike ride when I feel that things have, if you will, you know, gotten out of hand, that I read something and I go, oh my God, this is it. Or, oh my goodness, there's nothing I can do about this or whatever, you know, negative thoughts come into me. I actually just leave and go for a bike ride or I take a walk in nature and that rekindles me. And sometimes it doesn't have to be a long bike ride nor a long walk. It just is getting away from the problem. The problem being my inbox, my email Mm -hmm. is laden with both positive and negative stories, but sometimes the negative ones really prevail. Sure. And so basically what you're saying, first of all, I appreciate you sharing that. I know it can be, you know, sometimes feel vulnerable to share our own experiences with compassion, fatigue, and burnout. But I think it's so important that when I have expert guests on this show, that we can show this vulnerability and say, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, compassion, fatigue, it, it knows no boundaries right? And so basically what you're saying is you'll go out in nature, take a walk, take a nice long bike ride, and you're just, you're replenishing your, your resources. Exactly. I'm filling the tank. That, I mean, that's, you know, the, I'm trying to think of the metaphor that, you know, people really know, and that is you drive your car and at some point you have to go either plug it in if you've got an electric car or a hybrid or fill the gas tank. That's exactly what I'm saying. And I think part of it is being aware. I'm really aware of when I get into this grouchy mood, you know, like I'll go, oh, God, another story about animal abuse. Oh, my goodness. Another story about the loss of species. Another story about some habitat has been destroyed. And I get up and leave. And it's not to avoid it. It's that I know how much energy it takes. And every now and again, I know that I just don't have enough energy to deal with the situation at hand. Some people will just walk away from it. And I think that you probably know people as well as I do who just give up. And I don't mean give up in a demeaning way. They just go, I've had enough. I don't want to spend the rest of my life dealing with all the negativity. I'm going to go find something positive to do. Yeah, they're burned out. They're burned out. And for some people, it's irreversible. And for some people, they need to learn the signs. And you know, I'm, I'm hardly a psychologist and I'm no guru about it, but I'm really open, like I said, with the people I know well and who can take it, um, you know, because they know I'm not being critical of them. I'll just say, you're done. You're burned out. Oh, but there's so much to do. Yeah, there's so much to do, but you're not going to get any of it done if you don't take a step back. Then I think it just gets, you know, then I think it, when I say personal, I don't mean personal like in a bad or a good way. Then I think it just, it, it comes down to who the individual is. But like I said, my friend who's a psychologist said, you got to walk away from your brain. In, in my book, Rewilding Our Hearts, I talk about some of this where you get to the point where you just have to turn your brain off and go do something you love to do. It can be read poetry, go paint, go take a walk, go take a bike ride. Or one thing I do a lot, just sit on my couch and do nothing. No music, no TV, no radio, no books. And it's meditative. And sometimes I can rekindle in really five minutes, but just turning my brain off. That's the only way I can think of saying it. 
Yeah, I mean, we live in a world, especially today, it's so overstimulating. I mean, I went to fill my car up the other day at the gas station and there was a TV in the gas pump blaring at me. And I thought, my, my God, I can't even fill my car without all this stimulation. So we just, well, every now and then, just need to shut it off. Shut it off. The distracted driving stuff, for example. Right. Yeah, I, I have this really, po- this policy, unless I'm expecting, unless I need to do something, I'm very happy to leave my mobile phone at home if I go out for an hour or two. You know, every now and again, I might sit there and wonder, oh, does somebody text me or did somebody, you know, try to call me, whatever. But I do it intentionally because it's so easy to get sucked into that. You know, I mean, the gadget, the gadgetry and and the immediate, you know, gratification. I mean, I also, um, you know, I don't know if you and I experienced it, but if I get an email, I answer it pretty fast. If I get a text, I answer it pretty fast. I don't worry about writing full sentences or capitalizing or punctuating, but it's a way that I can decrease the load, if you will, and not in a dismissive way, but, you know, so many of the things that, you know, come in, like, you know, if you write me and you say, can we do this? I can say, yes, I don't need to write a book. (laughs) (laughs) And stuff. No, but I really do mean that, uh, Jennifer. And so I think, once again, I think it just comes down to people deciding what works for them and doing it and not worrying whether, you know, what they're doing is right or wrong. Yeah, and I think that that changes over time. So, you know, for example, you mentioned that you like to go cycling or walking to relieve some of your stress. But, you know, in a year, five years from now, maybe that changes, right? You have to just kind of listen to your body. Unlike the gas gauge, which is telling you your gas tank is empty, we have to really listen to our bodies. You know, do I need a massage right now or do I need to exercise? Do I need to look at my diet? Do I need more mm-hmm. sleep? You know, just, just kind of like always try to be in tune with your body and what does it need today, this minute to, to recharge? Yep, that's, exa- no, that's exactly right. I mean, I, you know, honestly, I lean to getting outside, number one, because I live in Colorado and it's easy to get outside. And I lived in the mountains for decades. And, you know, my best friends were wild black bears and cougars and foxes, for example. And I've also just been an athlete all my life. I've, been, I've done some high level athletics in a number of sports. I like cycling because I can just get a, to different places. I can cycle in the country here and see animals and I can go into the mountains. But what you just said, I think, is really the bottom line is figure out what, figure out what you need to do to rekindle yourself and realize that on any given day, it may be something different. But find something that, find something that at the end of which you feel like you've basically gone to the gas station without a TV (laughs) (laughs) in my case (laughs) and filled your car. Yeah. So by the time this uh, episode goes live, you will have released your new book, The Animal's Agenda, Freedom, Compassion, and Coexistence in the Human Age. What is this book about and what inspired you to write it? Yeah, that's a great question. Sometimes I have to think about it deeply because you know what writing books is all about. So what really inspired me and my co-author, Jessica Pierce, with whom I wrote a book called Wild Justice on the Moral Lives of Animals, we're, we're dissatisfied with animal welfare as it's basically practiced. And for those people who don't know what I'm talking about, it's really easy to cash it out. Animal welfareists or animal welfare science looks at the costs and benefits of what we do to non-human animals. And the typical calculus for it is if the benefits to humans outweigh the costs to the animals, something's permissible. Most animal research does not result in anything that then is used on the non-human animals. That, I mean, that's just a fact. It's, it's basically human motivated. So animal welfare and animal welfare science thinks that it's perfectly okay to do some very invasive, harmful research if the outcome will help humans. 
and it doesn't necessarily focus on individual animals. You know, they'll say, oh, you know, all, all laboratory rats are pretty much the same. All laboratory mice or monkeys are the same. The other aspect of animal welfare science or animal welfare legislation that will blow your mind is that the Animal Welfare Act in the United States, it's called the Federal Animal Welfare Act, it was drawn up in 1966. It's been revised a number of times. And in it, it specifically says that we are redefining the word animal to exclude laboratory rats and mice. This is not, this is not fiction. So basically what's happening is 99% of all the animals used in research, they're not considered to be animals and therefore they basically you can do anything you want to them. I mean, I know people will say, oh, you're being a little over dramatic. Well, if somebody wants to go into the journals and look at some research that's done on these rodents, it, it would turn your stomach. And oh, so, yeah. and so we, we, in this book, we discuss animals on factory farms and laboratories, companion animals or pets, animals in entertainment and wild animals. And the book is motivated by a number of different concerns. The first is that we need to focus on individuals. The life of every single individual matters. And it means that, number one, we can't just assume that a rat is a rat is a rat, or a turtle is a turtle, a turtle, or a chimpanzee is a chimpanzee, et cetera, et cetera. So we call this the science of animal well-being, focuses on individual animals. And what it does is it says that the interests of the animals in having a peaceful and safe life cannot just routinely be trumped by our interests or our needs. And so it means that there's going to be some things that we just can't do anymore that we've done. And there may be research projects that can't be done um, because they trump the animal's interests. And so that's basically what, you know, the book argues. And it focuses on what we call freedoms, not freedom, freedoms to eat what you want, to sleep where you want to sleep, to mate with whom you want to mate to hide or escape when you need to get away from something, et cetera, et cetera. So that's in, in a nutshell. And we're, we're really, really excited about it. It's been very well received. It's getting really good reviews from some, you know, library journal and book list. And I could go on and on. So maybe I've said enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm so excited to get my hands on this book. And I, I, I try not to get political on this podcast, but I'm going to. So, you know, we live um, in times right now where, for example, you try to do some research on animal welfare, animal testing on the USDA website, and that information has just magically disappeared, right? So I think it's so important that we have people out there like you, journalists, authors, people that are writing about these things that, that really matter. And so, you know, I, I just, I really thank you for that. Oh, I appreciate it. You know, I, the man under whom I got my PhD always had this ethic, if you will. I mean, besides being a great guy and being very concerned with animals, but showing the importance of sharing what we learn, if you will, in the ivory tower with, with the media. I mean, like doing interviews with you, getting out to people who aren't researchers, getting out to people who are hungry to learn about the inner lives, if you will, of other animals. And I think that, you know, the books I write, like The Animal's Agenda, they're all grounded in science. I mean, I'm proud to say that I've never had a book or a paper that gets into animal protection or compassion fatigue or anything like that be criticized because of the science. So I'm not trying to be over scientistic. I'm just saying that the science shows that we know enough right now. Literally, well, we've known enough for years, but we know enough right now and today that we're interviewing to stop doing some of the things that we're going to do. And, and you know, I was trying to tie this into sort of a big picture view. And I think when and if we do, and it may be decades away, my prediction would be that you will see a decrease in compassion fatigue because people will learn more about themselves and they'll, there may be just fewer things that they really need to do. I'm crossing my fingers for that. I don't know that I'll be around for it, but that's my take on it. 
So that is your your father's optimism coming through in you. It's my father. Yeah, it's my father's <laughs> optimism and my mother's being a wuss. <laughs> Right. I mean, I used to tell her that and she loved it. I, 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 anybody who knows me, I don't mean that in a demeaning way, but he, she just was really empathic. And she didn't sit me down and tell me to be empathic, nor my sisters. She didn't tell me to sit, you know, sit me down and teach me compassion. You kind of just, it's like osmosis. You know what I mean? It's like you imprint on it. You know, you, there's certain values that are expressed in a house that, you know, there's certain ways of doing things. Sometimes I, I just laugh and I do, I really laugh. My dad always used to say too, that sure life is serious and sure there's a lot of, that needs to be done, but the litmus test is, can you look in the mirror and laugh at yourself? And sometimes I just look and I go, are you kidding me? Did you really think that? Did you really do that? And if there's a lightness there. And once again, people who know me know that among my mother's last words to me were, be sure you play enough. Mm. And what she meant from by that, and I've written about it too, is play meaning get out of the seriousness, step away from your brain, go have a good time. So that's basically where I come to on this. Yeah, I think we could all use that lesson to kind of get out of our head once in a while. So Mark, how can people purchase the book or learn more about you and your work? Well, my homepage is just my name, markbeckoff.com, M-A-R-C-B-E-K-O-F-F.com. And of course, the book is available at all major booksellers online. And um, but I know bookstores are will have it. I mean, we've already gone through that with the publisher. And, you know, if they have questions, I, I write regularly for Psychology Today, and I don't know if that's how we, you know, got together. Well, actually, I am an avid reader of your uh, Psychology Today column. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they could see what I'm up to, you know, on Psych Today, and I usually ship some of those essays over to Huffington Post. But all the all the information is on my homepage. I'm I'm an idiot when it comes to technology, but I've got a <laughs> I've got a great web designer and web person, and I can just I can bribe him and say, "Hey Gary, <laughs> would you please do this?" And I'll send you some dark chocolate or a bottle of wine or something like that. Oh, um, that's awesome! But, oh, um, Mark, thank you so much for joining me today. It, this this has been just an absolute honor, and uh, I really appreciate your time and and all the work that you do. So thank you again. My pleasure. Thank you. I'm really, I'm touched and flattered to um, (laughs) see you about this because I think that that's what I was trying to say before is you never know when you're going to make these sort of improbable connections. And so I think the problems of compassion fatigue and empathy fatigue, if you will, cross species. And uh, like I said, my sister does this work and I'm astounded, but I'm not. She grew up in my household and I, I could end on that. She has not burned out. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And, and I hope this just adds to the toolbox for our listeners of ways that you can manage c- compassion fatigue. And I'm going to put those links on the show notes page at the compassionfatiguepodcast.com. So you can check out Mark's website and I'll also put a link on there so you can purchase the book. Mark, thanks again. Have a great day. You bet, Jennifer. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the Compassion Fatigue Podcast. Remember to head on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so you never miss a single episode. And don't forget to check out the CompassionFatiguePodcast.com for more great resources, including a link to join our private Facebook group where you can connect with other listeners and gain additional support. Please note that this podcast is not meant to provide medical advice or substitute for psychological care. Please consult with a mental health professional if you need additional support. And if you are feeling suicidal, please go to your nearest emergency room or call 911.